here tonight. Um, and we get to celebrate a baptism. So after uh, the, the night of worship, Ab- Abby reached out and she said, hey, like I, I placed my faith in Jesus um, back when I was younger, but I've never taken this step. I, I want to walk in obedience. And so um, she wants to do it in front of her closest friends and, and family. And so um, it's my joy to get to baptize you, Abby. All right, you ready? Put your hand over, right? Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in the newness of life. So let me pray as we get started tonight. God, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you that we get to celebrate with Abby, uh, that, that th- her life with you isn't something that is just uh, for her to keep to herself, but it's a declaration that she's proud of. And so, Lord, thank you for us getting to be a part of that uh, as witnesses, but also as brothers and sisters who get to walk alongside her. Because, Lord, that's what the church is about. Yes, it's about you. Yes, it's about us as individuals, but it's about us doing it together. And so, Lord, as we step into this evening of worship, let us do it together under one purpose, under one banner, and that banner is you. And so, Lord, bless us as we go this evening. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, and Lord, give us the freedom to do life with you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and worship. what freedom feels like this is what 
the faith that's underneath. You understand me. You understand me. You understand me, God. You understand. my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus He's never 
faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. Joy in chaos. I've got this that makes no sense. And I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I built my life for Jesus. He's never.
God of wonders, your power has no end. The things you've done before in greater measure, you will do again. There's no prison while you can break through. possible there's no broken body you can raise no soul that you can save all things are possible the darkest night you can light it up you can light it up God will provide let hope Why should my heart fear what you defeated? I will trust in you, Lord. There's no prison while you can bring through. No mountain you can move. All things are possible. There's no
calling for revival in this place. And we know that there is no darkness that can defeat your life, Father. As we continue worshiping, be with Seth as he brings your word. We love you and we praise you. In the name of pray. Amen. Amen. I was in love once. It was 2002. Why are you laughing? Her, her name was Jessie Jones. Man, second grade, hardcore crush. D-Dog's going to put a, a picture up there. Um, she's not the one that I was, I was uh, hanging next to. Um, don't pay attention that you can, I'm the only one whose feet you can see um, in the photo. Um, some things never change. But Jesse was on the far end. And so second grade, man, lunch pals, for sure is crushing on her. Come third grade, she's, she doesn't come to school. And I'm like, what's the deal? Word is Jesse Jones is moving. So I'm like, nah, I'm not going to believe it till it's, it's done. Well, after nine weeks, she moves to a different school and was crushed. And our class had won a, a reward. We, we had a pop party. I think we had, like, got the most pop cans, and so that meant, like, free drinks for everyone. But that was the day she moved. And so I knew, I knew I had no chance anymore. And so it came time for me to, like, put my pop order in, and I was like, I'm okay. I said No. As a, as a third grader, I said no to this free Coke. Ah, heartbroken, obviously. But it was a free blessing that I didn't know how to receive because I was like, oh, this my plan. It, it's not coming to fruition. Um, and tonight, we're not talking about crushes or loves, but we're talking about how to receive, uh, how to receive a blessing. And we're going to look at a story about uh, 10 lepers. No, not 10 cardigans that your mom's going to wear to Thanksgiving. Um, 10, like, people who had leprosy. <laughs> Thanks, Brendan. Uh, and so I, if we're going to be in Luke 17, verses 11 through 19, okay? Um, and, and in this story, Jesus is, has been in and around Galilee, Samaria, and as we're getting to the end of Luke, this is his kind of final trek into Jerusalem, where he'll, he'll spend the last few days of his, not only his ministry, but his life. Um, but if you, if you flip open, um, it'll be verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. And lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell at his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, raise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. And so tonight I want to talk about kind of the process to how to receive blessings. And I have, I have kind of a four-point process. Recognize that you have a need. In order to recognize you have a need, you need to receive by seeking. Okay, receiving requires seeking. And then your response to that reveals your heart. And then... Your rejoice will show who your God is, okay? And so point number one is recognize that you have a need. You see, these, these people have leprosy. And so leprosy today in 2020, they have a cure. So there's not a ton of people um, who suffer from this disease. But leprosy is a bacterial disease that mostly affects kind of the hands, the face, the eyes. So all of kind of your sensory motor uh, things, that's, it's a bacteria that gets it and, it and it looks disgusting. It comes off, it's white, and it kind of distorts your figure. And so being, being people, there are far more deadly diseases than leprosy. But because you can see it, that's the one you don't want anything to do, uh, to, anything to do with. And so people from uh, Leviticus to Luke 
to 1860, people were afraid of this disease. They were afraid that if, if you got any of that white stuff on me, then you would you'd pass along the bacteria to me. And that, even though that's not true, that's what people perceived as truth. And so not only did this affect their physical nature, it affected all aspects of their lives. You see, because not only were they visually unappealing, um, they were outcast because they were unclean. And so in that day, un- uncleanliness meant you, meant you weren't able to worship. And so these people, because people were fearful of them, they said, you, it doesn't matter what family you came from, it doesn't matter if your family has money, if you got leprosy, you're not even like a person to us anymore. And so even though they weren't condemned to chains or condemned to death, they were condemned to a life alone because of this physical disease. And even, I said, up until 1960, in America, it is Kalua Papa on Molokai Island in Hawaii. From 1860 to 1960, Hawaiians who had leprosy would be shipped to this kind of internment camp. They weren't in chains, but they couldn't see anybody from the outside world. They were, they were dropped off there to never, to never to escape, but to ultimately die. So as children with leprosy, they were sent to this island away from their family, away th- from their friends, to live out for however long their life would be alone. And that's the same as this group of 10 people. They were outcasts from everything that they were comfortable with, but in in misery, they found each other. And so the, the 10 people with leprosy, and they tried to make do the best that they could as beggars. And so there's a similar affliction that we share with these 10 people. Even though most of us don't suffer from this like chronic disease that make us outcast, all of us suffer from the same chronic thing that kills us from the inside. It's our sin nature. So we share that as in if if it's never dealt with, our sin will kill us and we will die as outcast. Me, you, and every every other person on this planet will die alone. These lepers had a need. We have a need. And it was important for me to start here because I'm going to give like practical to-do kind of steps to receive blessings. But here is why I have to stop. You have to know nothing you can do, nothing you can achieve, nothing you work for makes you deserving of blessings. It's not achievable on our own. So when I give these points, don't be like, oh yeah, I just need to try harder. Or I just need to read my Bible more. Man, if I if I just if I just love people better, then I'll get what's coming to me. It's it's not about that. It's not about blessings aren't about what we provide, what we bring to the table. It's not a deserved reward, but it is. It's simply a gracious gift. And so as I go and as I talk, know that how to receive a blessing starts with you knowing that you are in need of something greater than you can provide. And the the hard part is, and why I, I made such a point about that, is because many religions kind of base their, um, the way they do, the way they operate on achievement, our friends in Salt Lake City uh, and Hope Valley Church, and they're there to minister to this population of, uh, of Mormons. And if, if you don't know, uh, like, Mormon is like the first American religion. It took the good parts of Christianity that they wanted and then brought in the American dream and said, all right, throw those two things together and you have a religion where you can work to re- achieve to receive. And so that's some, they're not fighting to share Jesus. People in Utah believe they know Jesus. They're fighting to show that there's freedom 
in a, in a, a gracious God that all you have to do is place your faith in him. And that, and that there's, there's stuff that comes afterward. These steps are important, and they, but they come after faith. And I, I'm, I'm, being, I'm focusing on it in this room because y'all don't live in Salt Lake City. But y'all live in a culture where it's easy for us to get caught up in the doing of church. I get caught up in the doing of church. My job is to work for the church as a servant. And there's no greater blessing. But in, in, in doing in doing missions and doing discipleship, if, if all our relationship with Jesus is about is doing for him, then we miss the whole point. And it's a, a struggle in the church is because that's how we're raised to exist. So you create a plan and you do to achieve it. And even when you were little, you're raised in Sunday school. You do these steps. You read the Bible. You do this, this, and this. And that means you'll get to where you need to go. And that's not what God's word says. So we can't make doing and achieving the measure of success that we rest our life upon. We have to rest upon Jesus in order to receive his blessings. We have to recognize that we have a need. And then receiving requires seeking. So this is where there's some personal responsibility because the lepers, they looked at their skin, they looked at not having a job, they looked at not being able to worship saying, I can't do it on my own. None of us, we, have, we don't have a solution to this. But require, requiring the seeking of the individual isn't just a what was expected of these lepers, it's been kind of the theme of all of our how-to series. People crying out to, to Jesus, Jesus, please help us. And then Jesus responds in a way. And so they cry out to Jesus because they're desperate, they're alone, and we have nothing else to lose. And in their crying out, Jesus responds. But Jesus doesn't respond by snapping a finger and making their skin be healed. No, he responds by saying, all right, walk in obedience. Like, I see you seeking me. Now trust me and walk in obedience and go see the priest. And so we're like, okay, why Jesus? Why is that a necessary part of the equation? Why are we, why we tying the, the Jewish culture and the Jewish church back into this thing? Well, you see, the Jews would have known that if you were healed of your leprosy, if you were made clean, it would be a process that was done through the church so you can be kind of anointed as clean to live life again, able to go live, able to go work, able to worship again. And so the priest was a necessary part of it. And so Jesus said, all right, go take these steps. And he didn't do so because of the church at that time. He was being respectful of God's law. See, I, I didn't know this, but Leviticus 14 is, is all about the heal, what you do when someone's healed of leprosy. So the Cliff Notes version is this, is that it's an eight-day process. You make your sacrifices, saying, I recognize that I'm not clean. I couldn't do it on my own. Someone, someone healed me. Here's my sacrifice to give, give him the glory. And then it, there was seven days of resting in that, and then day eight is the best part. Then you would be, then your right earlobe and your right big toe would be anointed. Just so how, you'd feel super awkward, be like, why are we doing this? And it's because the priest is saying, you, this, this used to be unclean. This used to be unclean. This is what is healed. So whenever you touch your ear, whenever you put your shoes on, remember who did this for you. It was an act of surrender. It was an act of sacrifice. It was an act of remembrance. And so when we seek, that is what Jesus is desired, is, that's his desired outcome for these lepers. So it wasn't random. And while it wasn't random, he didn't expect them to do the same thing because Jesus came as the fulfillment of the law, not the breaker of the law. So he, he sent them not with sacrifices, but in obedience, knowing that he was enough. Jesus knew he was enough to heal them and make them clean and to send them off. And you see, like he gives the truth on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for everyone who asks, receives, seeks, finds. 
and knocks, the door will be opened. And so the same promise that's given in the Sermon on the Mount is given to these guys. You knocked on me, you called on me, so respond when I say go. The same thing's given to us. Yeah, you may not be splotchy, but you have a need, and you've got to cry out because you can't provide on your own. So he says, ask, knock. And I, and I like to say, if it looks like Jesus, walks like Jesus, and talks like Jesus, it's probably Jesus. Go through the door. Okay? And so responding to Jesus in obedience is critical for us, and it was critical for these ten people. And you know what? All ten responded in obedience. They had nothing else to lose. They seemed to find salvation at the hands of the priest. Upon showing up, they, their bodies were cleansed. They had a new lease on life. And up until this point, all 10 people share this story. Share the need, share the seeking, and sharing the, they shared the walking out in obedience. But this is the inflection point for the group. Because you see, your individual response reveals your heart. And the individual response of these 10 people revealed their hearts. And when you receive a blessing from the Lord, you can respond in one of two ways. You can either look down or you can look back. Okay, so looking down means you're in the Chick-fil-A line, you order that number four, get those eight count nuggets with that Chick-fil-A sauce and a sweet tea, and you're dreaming about it, and you pull up to the window, and you're like, oh, I can't wait to eat this in my car. I don't know where I'm going, but this is the most important part of my day. And you get to the window, and they're like, hey, the person in front of you paid for your meal. And you're like, ah, praise God. I'm going to enjoy this free meal on this person sent by the Lord, and it's going to be so good. You pull up, get your food, drive away, thankful. But, you know, th that $10 doesn't change much in your day. Um, but looking back means, man, praise God. I'm getting my Chick-fil-A nuggets, and man, so kind. I'm so grateful that person would be willing to pay for my meal. But you know what? I was going to pay for my meal anyways. I'm going to, how about I bless the person behind me? And so, and so you're like, hey, I'll pay it forward. I want, to, I, want to pay, I want to pay for their meal. Now, this is not a perfect analogy because if there's a soccer mom in a Tahoe behind you, college kids, like that's half of your months of rent. So like, but you're tracking, you understand, you understand what I'm saying. Our natural desire is to take the chicken and run. It's to look at our feet and be like, man, today's a good day. I woke up this morning. I look good. I have, have big goals for today. Like, I, I did it today. I made it. And it's very easy for us to just focus on ourselves and our plans and what we're able to do and what we're supposed to do. That we, get, that we get caught up in this mindset. And so imagine being these 10 lepers. You've been alone for years. Been alone for years. And then you have this taste of that chicken nugget. This blessing that's finally yours to receive. And what does your mind immediately switch to? It, it, it immediately went to all of those dreams. You've been dreaming about the day that you get to have a spouse. You've been dreaming about the day to have a home to make a living. You've been dreaming about the day you get to go worship again. And even those, those things are good, those things, when you take ownership of those things, they distract from the point, which is looking back and be like, man, Jesus provided this whole thing. And if we're not careful, we get in this cycle, and we just keep reminding of ourselves of, man, look at how we've done. And then, and then you end up later, and you've, you've missed Jesus You've missed Jesus. You see, nine of these lepers, they use Jesus as a means to an end. You see, because their heart reveals what they truly desired, Jesus sent them to the priest not as a test to determine whether or not they would be worthy of his healing. He was going to do that no matter what. He wasn't judging them based off of um, whether or not they deserved it because they don't deserve it. He was going to give them that gift anyways. But he was looking at their heart to see, man, 
Who is crying out to be healed? And who is crying out because they need me? And there's a big difference in those two things. Because remember, we're all needy. But not everyone recognizes that they need Jesus. And so, only one. Only one turned back. And that one was a Samaritan. Which, when, how Jesus words it, it kind of implies that the other nine should have known better. He says, the one foreigner is the one who turned back. Where are the nine who should know me? That implies those nine are Jews. And here's, um, I'm, I'm trying to read through the lines a little bit, but Jesus, his entire ministry was defined by working with people who took for themselves. See, he, he fed the 5,000. He didn't ask questions, fed the 5,000. People enjoyed their t- stomachs being filled. He, so they showed up the next day. He said, I'm not feeding you today, but follow me. And they said, No. Once they were satisfied and once they weren't going to get again, they left. And the same thing with these ten lepers. The miracle happened, but once they got what what was theirs, that was enough. And they left. But the one who should have known that, who, who, there's no reason he would know it, that Jesus was worth being followed, that he was, that he was the Messiah, he was the one that saw through the religion of being a Jew. See, the Samaritan knew nothing of Jesus' miracles. He knew nothing of the priest's role in the cleansing for worship, but the Samaritan knew that this man saved his life, and he was worth turning back for. It's harder to shake someone loose who, is, who has believed their entire life that they're a Christian. See, we live in the Bible Belt. People grow up going to church, and you believe, I've, I've grown up in church, so I'm a Christian. They say they believe in Jesus. They say they trust God. But they don't know what a relationship looks like. Jesus is trying to shake these Jews loose of this mentality that they're God's chosen people, and that's enough. And for us, it's harder to shake you loose to make you evaluate, man, are you in it for Jesus because you know you need him, or are you just coming to church because that's what you do, and that church is just part of your plan to live the rest of your life the way you want it? You see, and I think we would all say that we've experienced the blessings of the Lord, but many of us don't have more than that. Many of us don't have more than a moment that we point back to. You know, moments are significant. But if you only spend enough time with Jesus to experience him one time, you're missing who he is. You're spending too much time looking down and not enough time looking back at the one who got you there. You see, if a blessing is experienced and it's just a flash that's quickly drowned away whenever you're back in the normal flow of life, man, you probably look a lot like the nine. But if, man, that blessing was a spark that started a fire inside of you that changed your every day so that you may live for him over and over and over, not only for a lifetime, but for eternity, man, that enduring spark, that enduring blessing is what a relationship with Jesus looks like. And so your response and how you receive the blessings of the Lord shows what your heart's truly about. And so ultimately, how you receive blessings um, is evident by how you rejoice or how you rejoice reveals who you believe God to be. And I think this is the one that um, is the most important because, man, none of us would say that God's not God 
But man, how many of us live is that like we're the only God who's important to us. By how we rule, how we walk, how we talk. He's only as significant as being the man upstairs, but not the man inside. Because rejoicing is possible on all fronts. All ten people rejoiced. All ten people received. All ten people had a new lease on life. All ten people had an experience. All ten people received the blessings. All ten people had freedom. But is freedom to be able to do what you want the most important thing in your life? It's the American dream. So we're raised to desire. Because those things are good. But by the way, Jesus structured all of this. He was showing us all those things are good. But that's not what's best. That's not all that I want for you. He says, I want you to experience a freedom that's more than life. That's more than the things. That's more than the job. That's more than the worship. I want you to have all of it. I want you to have all of me. But for nine, that one moment of blessing, that blessing that gave them freedom, was enough Jesus. And they preferred to go rejoice. They preferred to go worship the plan they had for their own life. But for the one who I'm certain had dreamed about the plans once those chains would be gone, he said, I don't care what plans I used to have. I'm choosing the plans that identify with this man who changed me forever. And he, Jesus sent the Samaritan away with these words that he said all throughout his ministry to people who recognize this. He said, it's not because of what you did. It's not because of your seeking. It's not because of your obedience. But it's because of your faith that you have been made well. It's because your faith that you have been made well. Seeking and obedience are an important part of the process, but they are not the foundation of what Jesus desires from you. What he desires from you is a faith-based relationship that you can build everything else upon. So that when you seek, you seek because of him. Whenever you're obedient, it's because you're obedient to him. To have a faith that causes you to live like the words that Paul gives in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always, never stop praying, be thankful in every circumstance, for it is God's will for you. You see, being in God, with God, because of Jesus, is how you receive those things. Not because of what you have done, but because of the work that Jesus has already done in you. And so I'm going to challenge you guys. Just to, I want you to evaluate what type of freedom do you seek? Freedom to live the life that you have planned? Or to have freedom in the life that Jesus has planned for you? Look at your life right now. What do you seek? Many of you know I went to Europe um, before fall break, and I got to meet with some, some different pastors, some different church leaders. And I, um, the last pastor on my stop to Slovakia, his name was Richard. Um, and D-Dog has a picture of Richard's precious daughter, um, who they bust out of this um, just gray apartment complex with cracked windows and like communist housing of just like, let's pack as many people in here as possible. And out comes this just like radiant sunflower, just like, I was a stranger to her, and she's just like, here, 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 um, and, she, and she's like so excited to show us her house, um, but as I got to visit with Richard, he's, um, he's 30, he has a wife, he has two girls, and he planted a church when he was 25, um, he planted a church in his, um, the largest community um, near to where he grew up, um, the place that he went to high school, it's a community of 15,000 people with no evangelical church. And so it's like Weatherford not having a church. And um, I just got to hear part of Richard's story of like his dad was a, um, a military leader and that turned into a businessman who didn't love Jesus but had all of every, had anything he could ever need. 
But then, man, he went to a camp, and that moment sparked interest, and then interest sparked searching, and then he finally found Jesus, and he was like, this has to be everything he's made out to be. He has to be the truth. And so instead of going to university to study economics or finance or politics, he said, I'm going to go to seminary and give my life to him and his church. And so at 25, he moved back to this, on, it's four, three hours from a major city. Moved back to this, a dump of a town because he's like, Jesus has transformed everything about me. And I had the freedom to do whatever I wanted in life. But I, I want nothing more than to live with him and for him every day. And I think my plan, and I, I connected with Richard because I feel like my plan was right in line. I'm, I don't have a wife and two cute girls, and I have not planted a church. Um, but man, how the Lord is working in my life as I've searched, as I've surrendered and I've searched and been obedient. I was walking through um, the air, I think I was at eight airports uh, in that two weeks. Um, I was just like, what world do I live in that I get to do this for the Lord? Not just travel, but to meet these people, to hear these stories, to have a heart for what they're doing. I couldn't have got here on my own. I may have had a good life. I may have been 28 with a wife, with kids, with a house, working in economics. But nothing's better than where I am right now. And so I want to ask you, I know all of you have a plan for your life. And I have no doubt that you put time and effort to think about that. But I want to ask you a hard question. Have you ever been willing to let Jesus wreck your plan? Not many people do. But when we don't let Jesus wreck our plan, it doesn't mean we have a bad life, but it means we miss out on a lot of blessings that he promises us. And so I'm, I'm not standing here from the pulpit saying, man, if you give your life up to Jesus, you're gonna, your life is going to be easy and you're going to receive more blessings than you can imagine. I'm not in control of that. But I can say, man, I trust God's word. And I trust that Jesus is who he says he is. And I believe that he'll provide in an abundance for wherever you surrender to go with him. And I believe that life with him is so much better by far, by far than any plan we could have for ourselves. And so we sang the song that we built our life on Jesus. That he's never let us down. That he's been faithful in every season. So why would he fail now? So church, let us not sing his praises and then keep our plans to ourselves. So as we come to this time of response, I want you to respond how you need. If the Lord's calling you to surrender your plan and go into ministry Come to the altar. If the Lord's calling you to, to surrender your plan, to surrender your comfort, to be a missionary, come to the altar. If you, if you need to surrender your plan because you, you've never truly given your life to Jesus, come be the one who turns back and recognizes that you wouldn't be where you are without Jesus. And surrender tonight. So I'm going to pray and I want you guys to trust the Lord um, to lead you over these next few minutes. God, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for your example. And Lord, let your blessings not be distant to us. Lord, let them not be an experience that we've tasted once. But Lord, let your blessings be about the life that you promise when we choose you. And so Lord, I encourage these students to to say yes to you. Lord, I encourage these adults to say yes to you. 
There's no timeline on what responding to your will looks like. So Lord, let us be willing to choose freedom in you and believe that it's better by far. Amen. Let's stand together.
Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Uh, what a wonderful time of worship. We appreciate each and every one of you. Um, Seth, great job. Uh, if, like he mentioned, if any of you need to speak with anyone, uh, speak with staff, speak with, uh, come find us. We would love to visit with you. Um, but you are dismissed. Have a great evening. <laughs>